I come from a world of dreamers, and they see the future. Most of them are not coders. They find the access to technology or develop software very burdensome and complicated. There are lots of people you see around in the world who have great ideas. Very few ideas actually get implemented. They don't have the technical know-how. They don't have the resources to afford what they want to build. It seems to be this foregone conclusion that you have to be an engineer to be able to build software today. Our pure purpose is to let everyone take the idea in their head to the thing in their hand without needing to know how, or without having to deal with all the headaches that are associated. We're gonna help you build your app and we're gonna make it as easy as additional features and it simply then gets delivered. The AI is really smart and it's suggestive. It asks you what you wanna build. It asks you a little bit about what your inspiration is, what your ideas are. It's the ability to use the collective knowledge of what has been built before. It's even going to start thinking about who you are, what you might like. And then customize that with human coaching. We are building products which are like twice as fast, one third the price, and quality which is as bespoke as possible for a customer. This is fusion of human assisted AI. It is your partner for life because it will keep it up to date for every platform. It will deliver all of the cloud-based and other services that make the app run seamlessly. The teacher with an app idea to change the way we educate students. The wine owner who wants to develop an app to deliver wine to your door. From the little girl who wants to build a Pinterest for butterflies to the Uber for ski instructors. Creators, streamers, students, entrepreneurs can now see their idea truly transform. Software transcends everything from that little girl to the big organization. Anything that you could possibly think of, we can create it for you. There's nothing that we can't do. We're a generation of builders and we think that's going to just fundamentally shift the way the world works. What do you want to build? Hello everyone. Um, so this is more like an intimate chat, which is great. Um, feel free to stop me at any point if you have any questions. Uh, presentation. Uh, so we come from this belief that people shouldn't be shackled away from being able to build ideas, whether it's improving their business, uh, whether it's coming up with something to help their household, their business plan project, whatever it is they're trying to do. We feel that everyone should be empowered to build whatever that idea is without ever having to worry about technology. Just like you get on a plane and you don't have to worry about how it flies or you um, get in a car and you don't understand the engine mechanics. Um, so let's meet Alex. He's a really good example of one of our customers. Alex is a dentist. Alex is very good at making sure your teeth are clean, that your, your teeth are healthy. Alex runs a clinic of four different dentist practices. But Alex wants to build software so that when you're at home, um, your dentist is in touch with you. Alex wants to make sure that whenever you want to get an appointment, you get one of his best people, depending on what your appointment's for. Alex really wants to build Uber for dentists and wants it to grow beyond his own practices. Alex doesn't really understand technology. It's probably the hardest thing he's done in his life. Um, and so Alex came to Builder and, and used our platform to be able to build Uber for Dentists without having to write a line of code or speak to a single developer. There are many people like Alex. In 2017, just over half a trillion dollars was spent by small medium businesses building bespoke software. That was the first year it eclipsed enterprise outsourcing, which is about 460 billion. And this could be the whiz kid, um, the, the mother working from home, um, it could be the lifestyler, it could be a number of people that have got ideas. How many of us have met a friend that had an idea at coffee? Right? And then we met them two weeks later and then the idea was no more. And so we realized that 90% of ideas don't really go past the stage of the idea because it's just so difficult. And so when we think about, well, it's great, you can think about entrepreneurs, you can think about dreamers, you can think about people that you know, are thinking of these ideas. But these people exist in all parts of the economy. Because fundamentally, the old way of benchmarking the digital economy and the non-digital economy sort of was last decade. Today, the economy is split into four types of companies. There are tech companies, there are software first, 
that are software powered, and then there are everyone that are still to be digitally native. And tech companies we know about, people like Facebook and Google, um, software first are folks like Uber, where the core service is not software, but without software you wouldn't buy the product. Um, software powered is the winery. You're not going to buy from one winery versus another just because they have a better app. But you may be detracted from buying it. So what we're seeing is that across all stages of a company, there are people that now need to build software. Why is that? The real reason is most of our customers are straddling two fears. They're straddling the fear of um, irrelevance and the fear of failure. When you think about this part of the graph, these are people that are product managers, marketing managers, campaign managers, finance managers, human resource people. They're all trying to build software or build ideas to stay relevant in their workplace. When you think about categories three and four, these are actually the small medium businesses that are trying to come up with ideas. It could be the Uber for ski instructors. It could be the audience participation app for the BBC that was designed by the producer of the show, not by central IT. But for all of these people, it's really hard work. Building software is probably the hardest thing most people do in their entire life after university. I think exams is probably a little bit harder. And, and we can see that, right? It's not just a, a myth. 78% of software, 78% of the money that was spent in 2017 um, was basically flushed down the toilet. 400 and something billion dollars, four times vision fund was wasted uh, on people trying to build software that didn't ever make it to production. And why is that? Well, there's a lack of trust in supply. You pay a deposit, then you're beholden to the seller. Um, people don't know how to spec. In fact, that's the hardest problem. 90% of people can't go past the stage of an idea because they just don't understand how to produce a 20-page document that says, my idea means this. You know, we've had so many customers that say, I want to build an app like this, which is usually the taxonomy. My app is like Uber or my app is like Yelp. Even the US Air Force, the CIO of the US Air Force, I remember this conversation, I want to build Yelp for base services. And they expect you to understand what 90% of the definition means by just that one line. So then they'll focus on what they're really unique about their idea. And so when you think about um, that problem and the challenges, it's also not just about building. It's about building, running, and letting companies scale that idea. And so it's not just about producing the code, but it's really about making sure that it runs forever. Because software is like milk. It decays. It just takes a longer period of time. And so you have to continuously update it. You have to continuously fix it. But for the person that didn't even want to build it in the first place, didn't really want to come onto it in the first place. It's a tall order to ask them to start maintaining it now. And so we've created this turnkey platform that combines over 500 building blocks of reusable code. So how many people have used an app with Facebook login? Right? How many people use more than one app with Facebook login? And the point is, why is it developers rewrite the same code again and again? Why do designers design the same thing again and again? How many ways can you design a login button? How many ways can you design a, a map view? What we've created is distilled out 500 building blocks. We've put it onto an assembly line. And then we're connecting it to 75,000 creators around the world that actually work for 130 dev shops. We're buying elastic supply of capacity, much like Uber's drivers. And we're connecting it to de demand that's global, globally geodistributed, but making sure that the end-to-end -end process is really streamlined. And, and there's some sort of credibility to our story. We bootstrapped the company for four years. Um, we've probably done about 60 million, or now probably 75 million in aggregate revenue over that period of time. We've been profitable since year one, um, and we were very fortunate to raise a, raise a decent uh, Series A. But really what's important is we've been able to deliver to everyone from you know, Universal Music, The Roots, the US Air Force, through to, I kid you not, the little girl who wanted to build Pinterest for butterflies. And that shows you the diversity of where ideas come from. And a lot of this sort of, to me, was built on a fundamental set of key lessons as we think about the future of work and how entrepreneurship grows and, and changes. And one of them is really understanding where our customer is. Uh, and, and I was a huge physics favorite when I was in school, so I loved doing graphs. But really, most of our customers are in this situation. They start off with a fear of irrelevance. I don't want to be irrelevant. Who here wants to be irrelevant? No one. Um, and so if you don't want to be irrelevant, you usually come up with an idea to stay relevant. As you get closer to this line of fear, you realize that 
the, the fear of failure far exceeds the fear of irrelevance. And you enter this thing called inertia and you just don't move. Most of our customers keep yo-yoing here. And what we're trying to get them to do is escape velocity, get past that line of fear. And the problem is that unlike other things, when you start a business, you buy a PC, you buy software, it's instant gratification. We're the Facebook generation. Like, it's push notifications and, and instant feeling. Building software, you don't see anything for 10 weeks. And so you start off, you paid the money, you did all the hard work, and then it's 10 weeks of silence. Uh, and then you have all the issues that kick in. So a, a part of what we understood is how do we create enough emotion through the entire process that we keep them above this line of fear? Um, the other one was really understanding our demand strength. So just in the US alone, uh, on a limited set of keywords, almost 800,000 people were searching for keywords to build bespoke software in the small medium business category. Um, about 70,000, 65,000 showed refined intent. 13,000 people made a purchase. That's staggering. In the US alone, that means last month, some $350 million was spent building custom software by small medium businesses on a limited set of keywords. If you sort of extrapolate that from the data we have worldwide, we're thinking about seven to eight billion dollars worth of purchase just on a limited set of keywords. But really, when you think about the fact that 90% of people don't go past the stage of an idea, and the future of work is about people being able to own ideas, the market size is so much bigger. It's more like seven trillion dollars a year. And I think the final part is really understanding your scaling machine. Uh, and so we've really um, focused on what, what makes this impactful? You know, how do we fundamentally create something that moves the future of work forward? And a part of them is if we could allow 10,000 people at any given point in time to build ideas and do it in a way that was scalable, cost-effective, and efficient, that's enough to make a punch to how people think about what their work really is, whether they continue to be employed or whether they do something on themselves. And, and I think um, with many cases, especially in our case, it's never a top of the funnel problem. It's a middle of the funnel problem. It's how do you deliver this stuff at scale? Because it's quite easy just to build a very large software development company with a million people to do that. But that's not scalable or efficient in long term. And you have to think about where your customer is not a celebrity, but your customer is your hero, the person that's actually being able to showcase how they move forward. So we have this a particular customer, actually, a company is called Moodit, and wanted to build something that allowed people to track their behavior and their feelings um, so that they felt better in the day. Uh, and fascinating story, but the guy would have never built this had he gone to a normal dev shop environment, had failed twice time to go down, going down that route. And, and I'd say the last thing sort of from our own lesson was we were really focused on building a business that obviously turned a profit but delivered impact as well rather than just building a project that we were going to sell to someone. And please come and see our site. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sachin. Thank you, Sachin. Um, this is fascinating. Your, your mission is sort of very humble and grassroots in terms of changing the way the, the software gets built, but what is your wildest ambition for the company? I think at 10,000 pro concurrent projects, which we think is about four years away, um, you know, we've we become the largest single producer of software. Amazing. Uh, and, and allowing, well, producer to people that have ideas. Fantastic. Sachin, will you stay and join our yes, panel, thank please? You so thank much. you Please, have a seat. Uh, once again, uh, Sachin, thank you so much from engineer.ai <laughs> and builder. Um, one, one tiny switch. Uh, I was hoping Jen Heen uh, would join us uh, from Vixen Labs, which is absolutely brilliant in terms of voice recognition. You can meet Jen uh, at another point. But I'm delighted to welcome up our next uh, panel to sort of uh, explore this subject a bit more. And they're going to be led up by uh, Ian McGill, um, who runs Open Ops, by the way. And he's got an eye on the globe, by the way, because this is about government tenders around the world. So please welcome Ian, who will introduce the rest of the panel. Well done, Ian. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, so, as was just said, my name's Ian McGill. I run openops.com, and we've heard from Sachin. Um, and I'm just going to give the rest of the panel, so Phil and Justin, uh, Phil from Filament and Justin from Judil, to just do a little introduction about uh, their businesses and how they uh, use technology, particularly AI. And then we'll, from there, we'll, we'll start talking a little bit about the future and what the future might look like, and I'm going to try and provide some pushback somewhere along the line. So, Phil, do you want to get started? Yeah, thanks very much, and, and great talk, Sachin. Um, so, 
my name is Phil Westcott. I am the CEO of a company called Filament AI. Uh, we've been running for around three years, uh, operating out of London and Toronto, providing AI uh, professional services to uh, enterprise. So we help enterprise uh, build their AI capability, and we essentially take them from, uh, you know, from data study, from models, from ML, all the way up to building an application that delivers value. And that vertical stack is something that all enterprise are, are struggling with at the moment. And, and frankly, it's, it's a 20% data science problem and it's an 80% engineering problem. So uh, very much looking forward to the panel. Hi, everyone. My name is Justin Fitzpatrick. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Doodle. Um, Doodle is a company intelligence platform, so we use data to tell the story behind every business. And um, what that entails is basically bringing together um, billions of data points uh, on tens of millions of companies every day to um, build that into a knowledge graph and really contextualize the relationships that exist around a company, directors, and shareholders. Um, so a lot of the problem that we solve is uh, very much geared towards um, applications of, of machine learning and, and AI and being able to um, not just link together disparate data sets but also um, create derivative data that gives new meaning to, to, to that information. Thank you. Um, so it's really, you know, the, the title of this panel is ar around the future of work and I think, you know, broad as a subject that is, it, it's quite interesting to think about how our lives, you know, once I mean, and, and uh, you know, the notion that you actually get into an office, I think, is disappearing very rapidly. You know, when you log on, you start your work. How our lives are going to be changed uh, by technology and by AI over the next few years, I think, is a really at the core of what we're trying to do. So I know, for example, in Open Ops, we really want to progress with personalization so that you know, you don't have the minimal effort, you get the right opportunities direct into your inbox without actually even having to type in a keyword, that kind of thing. So I just wanted to uh, ask each of the panel members where, where they think technology will take the future of people's work over the next uh, few years. Sashin, can sure. I start with uh, you? So, you know, when we always think about software, we never think of software as a cottage industry. Uh, and. Uh, up to now, software development has been a cottage industry. It's sort of uh, groups of people that work together on a big problem and they're through the whole process. Every other cottage industry has been industrialized. And, and what does that mean? It's meant the repetitive work's been removed. Um, customization has become not an infinite game, but one of many, which feels like infinity, but is not infinity. Uh, and um, you've created uh, specialists that are uh, detailed and in-depth thinkers about specific areas and not generalists that you know, can build the soup to nuts of a car. And, and so as we think about how our business works and, and sort of what we're doing in that development ecosystem, we see the same parallels happening in other places, which is things that were repeated, um, uh, almost sort of paper pushing or um, just workflow driven pieces of work, um, those jobs will um, fall to automation. At the same time, there's an ever-increasing amount of work that's coming in for more skilled, uh, more higher value, more top of the stack. And, and just in software development itself, if you think about 90% of people who have ideas and don't build it, and suddenly now, even if 10% more are building it, you've got double the demand. Um, and so you have to have some of it go to automation. So I don't think it's a, an AI is going to eat everyone's lunch problem. I think it's going to be a shift up the stack, which has actually happened throughout the last 200 years. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to use the, the example of Sashin's client earlier, the, the dentist. And I, and I think dentists are probably some of the most entrepreneurial people on the planet because I've had about three of them come up to me with this great idea in baking AI into their surgery or their supply chain yeah. or their outbound marketing. Um, What's, what's interesting is where you're helping them to be an entrepreneur and build an engineering application, we're helping them to turn their expertise into machine learning models, which is then baked into that application. So not only does it allow you know, the patient experience walking into a dentist surgery to be kind of alive with technology and you know, uh, conversational interfaces, you know, being able to source um, 
knowledge and information about their particular medical conditions. But also it's able to tap into data sets and personalization and all the, um, all the capabilities that AI unlocks from you know, your personal data and, and the broader data around dentistry. And that's just one industry. And it's transforming as we speak. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's remember this is not just about big enterprise. There is, a whole, there is a whole gamut of where AI is influencing work. I've never heard dentists being referred to as the most entrepreneurial people on the planet. <laughs> that's, uh, that's good. I'm heartened to hear that. Um, so, you know, I think when I, when I think about the, the future of work, um, you know, I think about one where there's kind of less toil and drudgery. Um, and I think that there's a tremendous pocket where technology can play there to help reduce the toil and drudgery that we often experience in our our day-to-day -day working lives. Um, you know, one of the, we're doing a lot of work in, in the financial services industry, particularly with um, banks, insurers, asset finance providers, uh, alternative lenders who have a sort of SME line of business. And um, what's interesting about um, those business lines is that they're entirely manual and paper-based and you know the turnaround times are measured in days or weeks so if you want to go and open a bank account for your business um, with one of the high street banks it's going to probably take you a few weeks to, to, to get through the process um, so we, we partnered with with one of our clients and actually did a study in six of their branch locations um, and looked at the tasks that their relationship managers and credit partners were, were, were executing on in the process of um, you know, opening an account and underwriting a loan. And we found that they were spending up to a day and a half of their time every week just doing manual data entry and copying. It was even worse than that because they were sort of copying data that they had already inputted in one place and had to input it into another, right? So, um, you know, that's obviously a, a, a pretty bad way to spend your life, um, you know, doing, doing data entry, um, repet you know, repeatedly. Um, but it's also a terrible customer experience. It doesn't scale, you know, it's the, the, the businesses are under all kinds of cost pressure, right? So there are all kinds of reasons why you would want to remove that drudgery and toil from the, from the workflow. Um, and as a result of, of working with them to integrate our API into that customer journey, they took out 25 million pounds of cost. Um, the time to open the account went from weeks down to you know minutes and hours, depending on how complex the case was. And so, you know, when I think about the application of of you know not just AI and ML, but technology more generally, um, there's the opportunity to reduce a lot of that drudgery and toil. Um, the question that becomes is, you know, Sachin was saying, you move higher and higher up the skill stack. You know, what do you do with the people who used to be? just doing the data entry, and they were happy doing the data entry, right? Um, so I think we have a responsibility you know, as a so society to kind of ask those questions as well. So um, someone the other day uh, I was speaking to was, was saying well, broadly, actually AI is pretty easy to do badly. It's really easy to do it badly, and it's virtually impossible to do it really well. and. Um, and, and, and that sort of chimed with something else that I learned this week, which was that 85% uh, of banks in the US still, the mainframes, um, are mainly using COBOL. So <laughs> um, do we end up creating, uh, and this is the pushback really, do we, do we end up creating these models that kind of work really well in 80 or 90% of the cases, but you know, we got this long tail of stuff that doesn't get solved, and then we embed that in our systems, and, and in 40 years' time, someone's still going to be going, oh, yeah, it uses an L, you know, Python and LTK from, from, from Python 3, and we're all sat there laughing. Is that where we're going to be? Uh, I'll start with, with, with you, Justin. Um, I don't know. I'm not, I, I guess I'm kind of wondering how much of a problem that is from the perspective of, you know, I don't think the goal should be to kind of automate everything and always have the latest, you know, the latest release of whatever built into our, you know, our operating model. So, um, you know, that to me is really where you see this, you know, kind of partnership, not that we're going to all be shaking hands with robots, but, um, you know, that partnership between, you know, technology and, and, and humans. And, you know, there was, uh, you know, Gary Kasparov wrote, um, wrote a book that was released a year or two ago. And it's funny because I was, I was reading this book and, 
um, you know, he's obviously talking about his experience playing against Deep Blue and the kind of evolution of, um, you know, kind of chess playing computers and things like that. And at the end of the um, at the end of the book, he goes, "Yeah, and you know, they've cracked chess, which can kind of which is complex, but it can be solved with brute force." you know, when will AI ever solve a problem like, you know, a game like Go? And you're <laughs> kind of like, you know, it, the book was published two years ago and, you know, sort of feels out of date. But the, the point in, in raising that was that, you know, he, he gives this example that, you know, uh, machines have been better than humans at chess for a while, but humans and machines are better than machines at chess. Um, and so I think that's really where you start to see this opportunity for, you know, people leveraging technology to do higher value and more powerful, you know, solve more powerful problems. So, Sachin, I'd come to you on this. So, you know, are we baking in problems for the future and the decisions you're making now? Or do you see it all as so, so upside? I think, it's, uh, I think it's the severity of the problem you're solving, right? So most AI systems will fall into three categories. They're either in the loop, out of the loop, or above the loop. So in the loop is like the machine really can't do anything except recommend. Uh, out of the loop is it does it autonomously, but you would never do that for like cancer treatment or flying an airplane entirely on its own. Um, and then there's above the loop, which is that it sort of audit 10% and then you feed that back in and it makes an adjustment. I, I think problems need to have the right solution. Uh, I also think that when we think about AI as folks that are in the industry, we, you know, we think about machine learning, we think about prediction. When we think about AI as sort of just a population, it's become sort of synonymous with anything that's automated and has perceived intelligence. Uh, and going back to that example of, you know, you could do 100 iterations and it feels like infinite. Uh, and, and so I think the, the, the broader question is, where do we use technology to automate or um, redefine how we've done something? Uh, and is there enough uh, sort of a risk-reward ratio for doing that? Uh, and I think that's been the same old adage for, you know, the last 30, 40 years. And, and we've seen in some places like, you know, operating traffic, um, flying planes through waypoints, it's, it, it will do a better job. It doesn't get tired. Um, and, but in other areas, and, and I think to your point, we shouldn't just do it for the sake of doing it. Uh, and I think as, sort of as a, as a civilization, we have the risk and tendency to do things for the sake of doing them um, without necessarily a, a sort of feeling the impact much later. And, and Phil, so you must have situations where you, you're talking to a client and they say, oh, I've got this amazing vision and I want to do this. And, and you probably have to say that's going to be, we're not going to be able to do that. We can't do that. So how do you, how do you broach the limits of AI and how do you, you, know, what, what do you, how do you deal with the challenges of actually saying that this, this, with the amount of data you've got or with the infrastructure you've got, we just can't do that? Yeah, I mean, most clients have been, let's remember, on a journey of improving. It's not like they're only starting now with the onset of AI. And the last decade has seen RPA has been the main way in automating processes within enterprise. And that has really tackled the issue you've made there, that the systems of records... Sorry, can I come at RPA? Robotic Process Automation. Okay. Um, and depending on who you ask for a definition of AI, that's either in or, or not. But AI, AI is, a, is a broad church, right? Yeah. Now, RPA has been solving the issue between um, systems of record and systems of engagement. Systems of record in, in banks in particular are very difficult to alter, very expensive to alter. But what it gives you is a methodology to kind of broach that gap. And the RPA vendors, the, the blue prisms, the UI parts, very much target that. Now, that's, that's process automation, but it is limited in its ability to... Uh, automate process that st and start to get a bit more complex. And that's why it's, it's a big industry in its own right. It's a $3 billion industry, RPA. But AI and machine learning, natural language processing technologies, is a, is a $20 billion industry. So what you can start doing is making huge transformational changes to productivity. And I'll give you an example that's very close to Justin's uh, called uh, clientele, because we actually are a user of due deal data in some of our projects. Um, and we can talk about the ecosystem of value, the value chain in a moment. But it is helping a private equity firm to transform the way in which they do um, origination of deals. So it's using the insight about um, small companies to identify which companies suit their investment thesis. 
And that's allowing them to double the amount of assets under management in a year with the same origination team. So that's not, a, that's not an RPA tweaking a process incremental improvement. That's doubling the productivity of their deal origination. So that's, that's an example of where the, the industry is at the moment and the opportunities. That's very interesting. And, and, and yeah, to, to sort of you know, imagine doubling the productivity of your team would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Um, so I'm just thinking uh, one of the things that I, I, sorry, I wrote an article recently on our blog about AI in procurement, and, and there's this double edged sword with all AI. And one of the possibilities is that it would be really easy to respond to tenders. You could automate the generation of text. Um, but equally, uh, corrupt buyers could generate specifications that they would know would probably end up with a contract being awarded to a particular supplier. So they could use AI and neural networks to predictively um, tweak the specification so that there was only going to be one winner and it would be really hard to spot that. And it just, so since we're you know, at COGX, where, uh, where is the line do you see? Where, where is that double-edged sword element in the work that you do that makes you worry as well as be enthusiastic about the future? So, so we have a really funny example of this. So um, you know, we work with 132 dev shops in 12 time zones. So when we launched, it was only 30. Uh, and we built a really simple, I wouldn't call it AI, but it was a, a code analyzer that could basically stack rank code and say, is this guy good or bad? Uh, and give it a percentage with some tags. I started noticing like, how could a guy start with 80% as a score? And then by the first time they do an assignment with us, it's 20% or 25%. percent we like scratching our heads saying, it's not the same person, it's not the same person. Um, and what we realized was that the Eastern European dev shop were gaming our system. They would get the best person to do the test, and then they'd get other people to do the work. So everyone was scoring so high entering the platform, and then like huge fall in score. Uh, and, and, and actually, so we ended up building an OR, again, you could call it early stages of AI, an OR-based algorithm that said, oh, we're not just going to look at what you did in your score. We're going to take a picture of your face. We're going to take a picture every three minutes you're doing work, between three and seven minutes. You don't even know when it is. Um, but also, then we built a, a parser that could see how stylistically the code was written. So we could say, well, this is not the same style as how you write code. It's not the same person. And so, and, and the problem was, because we weren't dealing with you know, 10 developers or 50 developers, we have to go manage a workforce which is you know, the size of Infosys for all intents and purposes. Um, but we only have 150 people in the company to manage it. So we had to rely on intelligent and unintelligent automation to be able to manage that workflow. So it's, it's a reverse side of the, sort of the, the contract defeating. We would never be able to operate, and I'll give you another really silly analogy. So, if you go to Accenture to build software uh, or build a project, it's 11 weeks before the first line of code is written. Or any of the big software competitions say that just about Accenture. Um, we're, at, we're at 72 hours. Other SIs are. Other available. SIs, <laughs> yes. Uh, we're, at, we're at 72 hours before um, uh, the first line of code is written. Uh, and, and, a, and a part of that is just that ability to procure in an unbiased way. Um, can only be done by machine at scale. Interesting. So, uh, Justin. Yeah, sure. Where's where's that knife edge? Where's the line? Yeah. So, um, one of the one of the real challenges that we help our clients solve is around um, understanding the true nature of what a business does. Um, so, if you walk into most insurers today, um, they will be classifying risk at a portfolio level based on something like SIC codes, um, and that's not specific enough because you have 20% of companies in the UK that are basically other right now. So trying to underwrite other is, is difficult. So um, we've created a proprietary data set which has uh, 34,000 keywords which, gets, which get tagged to the, the business to help um, describe in really granular detail what that business does. So you could type in SaaS or FinTech as a kind of category or you could go down to you know, the level of almost a product like cider makers or PVC tubing or whatever. Um, so what that allows is obviously a, a, a kind of company specific approach to risk. So if you're an insurer or you're lending to that business, that's, that's great because now you're able to price that risk much more effectively. Um, if you're the government or kind of society at large, um, one of the aspects of 
pricing risk on a portfolio level is that you know you're kind of it's it's a rule it's a lo- rule of averages right so you're kind of subsidizing you've got the really good risks in the portfolio subsidizing the really bad risks in the portfolio so now if you're able to zoom in in a much more precise way and figure out whether that company is good or bad um, you're able to concentrate more of the resources into the really good companies and you're basically accelerating the death of the bad ones by starving them from opportunities or pricing them out of the market so you know that's you know that, that's kind of neither good nor bad that just is one of these things that we sort of have to be aware of as a consequence of you know applying technology in in new and different ways and I you know I'm not advocating that we try and you know, halt the progress of, of technology or our ability to do this, but it sort of raises different questions, I think, for, you know, for the banks, for, um, you know, the insurers, for the, the regulators who have to sort of create something that works for a lot of people. And subsequent ethical issues societally around it. who gets employed in good companies versus bad companies and how you identify that up front would be interesting. Yeah, it's like hyper uh, capitalism, right? Because if you're on a downward trajectory, you. It's just that creative, that loop of like, yeah, yeah. creative destruction just kind of starts spinning quickly. Yeah. Um, so, slightly different take on the, uh, on the risk as it plays out is you've got in the value chain very dominant platforms that are providing the, uh, the algorithms to all the other industries and the platforms to build their own algorithms, to be fair. Um, You've got data providers who, you know, at least that that will always tend to be something unique because either they've built up that database or, you know, they're a, um, they have an unfair advantage. They're a facility that has their own data that no one else is going to take off them. But the platform players can start to dominate even more than they do already because if you think about it, they start to own the conversation with the society, with the population via your, you know, your Alexas and Google Homes. You know, we, we partner with both those organizations um, very effectively, but you, you can't deny they are starting to dominate all the interfaces to our world, first through our, our shopping habits and our, uh, our internet searches, and now with conversational interfaces, they're starting to dominate that as well. So my, my, my fear is for individual brands who, who no longer have a direct relationship with their customers, they will always have to play through one of the platforms. I don't necessarily think that's healthy from a competition standpoint. Thank you. I'd like to open up uh, questions to the floor. Has anyone got a wonderful panel here? Surely there must be a question. Oh, oh wonderful. Thank you. I think it's fascinating. I'm an architect. I'm, uh, not really, uh, uh, I'm very interested in this. Could, could you just tell us who you are and where you come from? Got a microphone? I'm Tia Sam, a space agent architect here in London. Um, I'm very interested, obviously, in the uh, digital uh, debate here. Um, one big question for me is, uh, obviously, um, you, we, we touched on this, is, 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 as you said, the, the control of Google and so on. Um, AI, to me, sounds also <coughs> a bit of a fig leaf, because ultimately, you're collecting data, um, holding that data and have algorithms to sort the data and you know so th- there's nothing sort of super clever about this but the concentration of power gets gets stronger and stronger as yeah? more and more centralized and I uh, and that's uh, I think this is the, the biggest worry so that's why this of a fig leaf element I think is, is, <coughs> is very, very in a way dangerous really so uh, I don't see it like an answer to this <laughs> really how how you break that, and I really like your idea with the inner loop, side loop, and top loop question, because that really gets to the heart of the whole AI thing, is that God or, and the human being obviously can be outside the system, so it can monitor itself, really, and I would be curious, really, whether you can see there is actually something like a, like an, a human outside the system, uh, uh, conscious or not, at some point. So I don't think so, really. Uh, but. Would, would it be <laughs> fair to summarize that, that you have <coughs> grave concerns about c- consolidation as a result of using it's platforms? That, yeah. yeah. So, Justin, do you want to take that on? Or, or <laughs> I'm not sure there was an actual sure I'm question. Ready to take that on. Yeah, it feels like a, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so, 
um, just to kind of zero in on the question more specifically, is it is, is was the because I heard something at the end about um, it, w does AI have the ability to become conscious? Is that sort of where you were going? Yeah. So so the first one was the concentration. What thoughts on the concentration of power or whether those companies are too powerful already? I'm going, to, I'm going to push back. I, I will, Justin, I'll come to you in a minute I, I, and, and to you, Session. I'm going to push back slightly on that because, no, number one, I think AI is actually terrifyingly clever. And I think so if you look at some of the recent academic papers on transfer learning in NLP, um, you will see some really um, substantial changes to the point where, with, with given sort of four or five tiny bullet points of text, uh, Google's um, uh, BERT code can actually write a 300-word, 400-word article that is credible from those tiny bits of text and nothing more. Um, and so this idea that we, we're just sort of like, okay, you, you're just buying in, pushing data onto servers and, and running rather ordinary um, algorithms, I think is it, we're moving away from that, and some of the changes are, are really accelerating. As for cognizance, hmm, I, I think that's in our judgment. But, but Justin, have I made things worse or better? Yeah, on this no, one? I think I, I, I like your answer. I think let's stick with let's stick with that. <laughs> I, I mean, the only thing I would I would probably add is that I think it's super unfair to just say that it's a marketing trick to get data, uh, which I think is the underlying point of the, of, of your statement. Um, Fundamentally, if you had petabytes of data and you had to run an if-then algorithm through it, the likelihood is it's going to take a month. The fact that Google can give you a search result in a second um, is clear that technology has evolved, and it's a, it's a step change over time. The fact that today six people have to sit together to be able to build software so that they can talk to each other about how each of the modules are going to communicate. and we're building, building, building blocks that are auto-sensing that already know who else is on the block and can communicate with each other. We've just reduced the amount of work that a human engineer needs to do by 30, 40%. That's not incremental ev evolution. That's not incremental um, uh, innovation. That's evolutionary. Um, and unfortunately, through history, you've always had protagonists who believe that there is some dark theory around why you know, we're collecting data and what we're doing. And I think that's why there needs to be these fail-safes around in the loop, out of the loop, and above the loop. But um, the ability for diabetes to be diagnosed um, through diabetic retinopathy, the ability to do um, uh, scans of um, uh, mammary glands to find out breast cancer, at just the sheer volume at which we can do it today, that is both visual, image, cognitive, all three. That is not data and a simple algorithm that's been running that was running when we were using punch cards into machines. I think that's, uh, I think that's being very unfair to where the industry's moved. Do you yeah, have... I just wanted to add, there is a bit of an antidote to this dominant story, which is the fact that all organizations, from big enterprises through to your dentist again, you know, there is an opportunity to train and own the IP of your own algorithm. Now, these platforms don't just supply you uh, algorithms off the shelf, they also give you the tools to be able to train your own. And that is, that is something unique about the AI value chain, is that you can own the intellectual property of a machine learning model that you have trained and is trained based on your expertise, whether it's as an investment professional or as a dentist, that can be yours. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, it's, uh, it means that you can, you, know, you can have your part of the value. And no one can take that away from you because that's based on your training, your annotation, your expertise. And, and I think just one last thing to add to that. There's actually a reverse concentration risk because as you make things cheaper, easier, and less technically required, like go back 50 years or you'd use punch cards and you had to read a book to understand which punch card to use and now you can just come up with an idea and it gets built. 
um, you're now going to see a, a way where people are going to move off the concentrated marketplaces because they can actually operate on their own. You know, there used to be this want to be in the top 10 apps. Now there's actually a want to be in the 15 to 25th app. That reverse concentration movement is only happening because technology is being automated and being made simpler. Thank you. Um, one more, well, um, hopefully we've got time for a couple more questions, but wonderful, a woman. We, you've got a man all here, so I would love to hear from someone else. Hello, um, I'm not going to this is a really basic question. Um, can, I, can I find out who you are? Oh, yeah, hello, I'm Charlotte. I'm from a company called Katie, which is the biggest beauty company in the world. Fantastic. So um, my question is, how do you feel AI and data is working with um, apps such as GDPR and Able? Do you feel like the more data you're collecting, there's a bit of scaremongering happening with data harvesting, and has that affected you in any way? In any way? So, do you people actually know what GDPR is and the subject access requires around it that doesn't affect you, or do you think this is going to play a bigger role in years to come around? To your point, around people being scared about how much data you actually have on us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can take that. I one. can. I can. <laughs> I can swing right over yeah, to you because so I know you have data on individual company directors in your data. We do. Yeah. I mean, so so um, you know, we we have to be GDPR compliant. It's not as much of a concern for us as it would be for say you know Facebook or something like that because of the nature of the data that we collect and the majority of information that we collect happens to be you know on the company entity as opposed to the individual, but. Um, I think, you know, to, to kind of answer your question, um, you know, people I think are becoming, certainly in Europe anyway, are becoming a lot um, savvier in terms of understanding um, the value of their, of their data and we're kind of moving towards, um, uh, you know, new, new models of, um, you know, how we potentially monetize that, how we, um, you know, control access to that, to that information. At, you know, at the end of the day, for me, it comes back to what's the value exchange look like, right? So people are completely willing to put pictures and, you know, all kinds of personal information up there for public consumption. Um, but there's, you know, th there has to be a very clear kind of value e exchange associated with that. I think where people start to get a little bit edgier is where you know, this idea that somebody is holding on to their data and then it's being used in ways that maybe they haven't consented to or they're not, you know, they don't really quite understand. So, you know, for me, I, I think the, the, it's incumbent on us as, as you know, builders of, of digital products to the extent that we're, try, you know, asking um, data subjects for information to make it really clear what that value exchange is and why, you know, why we're, they're being asked for that information, how it's going to be used and, and what they're going to get in return for it. I, yeah, I think, I mean, I think both you and, and Phil have this sort of situation where others are bringing data to your platforms or creating data through your platforms, and that might create some really challenging oversight issues for you as businesses. So so for us, it's a really simple one. We, we don't capture anything that defines the individual. We capture everything that will allow us to define the micro-segment, because micro-segments are what you need for um, analysis and recommendation. Um, I guess the only part where we capture, and we don't really capture because we can't identify the developer, is we have a face hash for a developer and we have their lifeline of what they've done with us. We can't, define, we can't reverse and define who the developer is, we can just tell if it's you. Yeah, well I was going to give you an, an example from a, from a world that would be very familiar to regular COGX attendees. Um, you, you recall the last two years, if you walk around the expo, there were chatbot frameworks all over the shop. You, you know, build, a, you build your own chatbot, uh, get it up in, in days, not weeks. The problem that industry is now facing is stuff like GDPR and security concerns and deploying it within your IT infrastructure. Chatbot industry has now grown up to a point that they're struggling with those real issues. Um, just to give you an example, we, um, we built the chatbot for HSBC in the US actually, and one of the big um, challenges we helped them with there was how do you anonymize personal information that their customers are sharing with the chatbot before it gets sent to one of the cloud providers that does the natural language understanding on it. So, I mean, that's quite a technical point, but you can see that this is very much um, a, a, a problem that needs to be solved. And back to my earlier point, it's now... The, the technology is 20% the machine learning and the NLP and that. It is 
the engineering that you put around it to get the value out of this clever technology. That's where the industry is at at the moment, including in, in health and beauty. Yeah, I, and I would go one further into that. If you do AI badly, you're really opening up yourself to risk. So do it properly. I have a question, uh, gang, because it's been on my mind all morning with education. It strikes me that the reason work isn't easy for a number of people is because it simply isn't enjoyable and it doesn't have meaning for the individual, for the wider world. So my big question to us COGXers is how can AI and technology enable more people to find work which they enjoy and which has meaning? So just a tiny little question for our final five or ten minutes. I think, I think training the, the company's AI is quite a cool job. And, and the, those that get into it, you know, annotation and d downloading your, your knowledge into the company's artificial intelligence models. That's exactly what, um, you know, the, the research guys did on the due deal data and on other data sources and on company, company websites to be able to, you know, bottle their expertise. So I think it's quite a cool job actually. That's just in enterprise. And then in entrepreneurship world and, and grow, growth businesses, uh, it just presents so much opportunity, either if you're owning the algorithm or helping others uh, to build it. Um, yeah, so I would kind of go back to the example I cited at the beginning and, and um, you know, this thing about taking the, the toil and drudgery out of work because, um, you know, we, we could quantify the direct cost savings as a result of that relationship manager not spending a day and a half a week doing manual data entry. But of course, there's also, um, you know, some, uh, you know, kind of time created effectively in their week now where they can actually have conversations with customers or they can go out and look for new customers or they can, um, you know, have a more informed conversation with that customer about what their financing needs are. So, you know, I think really that's where um, the, the opportunity is to sort of arm people to have better and more meaningful connections and do the kind of work that gives them joy. I don't think anybody's going to be particularly upset that they can't, you know, spend time doing the, the manual data entry anymore. So, um, you know, that's kind of where I, where I, I see it going. But I think that's a, an important point to raise because, you know, I'm going to be a bit of a knob and, and quote Voltaire here, but, you know, he says that there are kind of three points to work. There, you know, it, it's, um, it, it creates, uh, it, it sort of defends against boredom, vice, and, and provides for needs, right? So. This is where we, you know, we have the opportunity through technology to provide for the needs, but then you've got to think about the other two as well, like the boredom and, the, and keeping people away from vice, and that's where the, the, the human relationships come into it. I, I think when you're starting to use the word knob, your assimilation know, know, is complete. <laughs> Sashin. I, I would just say that, you know, I think over the last 200 years of philosophers, you know, starting from Socrates onwards, all define work as a means to an end, not the end. I think the very fact that we're having a conversation where will people find meaning and happiness in work means that that's defined as the end. I think where we're moving to a world where you know, a four day week is now actually possible, which was never possible 10 years ago, because ultimately the end is spending time with your two year old or your family, um, or being able to explore nature and, and the environment around you, because only then are you really living. Otherwise you are forever working. Uh, and I think this is the first time sort of at a point in history after the industrial revolution, we're at a place where people can start being human again because machines are augmenting the things that they don't have to do anymore. And that's really the true meaning of being happy. So I, I'm, I, I've got a slight counterpoint on this, which is that you know, the introduction of automation in, um, in the 1950s into the home actually presaged the highest rates of depression in women who didn't have work because they basically, the, they, they were left wondering what on earth the, they were supposed to do with their days, and um, and it was gin and Valium in far too many cases. Um, and I think the creation of taking away the drudgery will not create purpose, and it is the purpose that that is what gives you your self definition. And I think there's a very real chance that actually by taking away drudgery, we we climb the wrong mountain. So you end up with lots of people who are like, oh, okay, I've got an easier work day, but I'm still doing something that I don't find morally engaging. So I still work for a casino or whatever, not to, you know. And, and so I think one of the biggest challenges we have is to, is to try and 
create meaning in work and as businesses, you know, whether you are, whether it's some, someone like us who, who strongly believe in open data so that we can use the data for anti-corruption, that allows my team to get up and work and they feel like they're contributing. But if businesses are going to be exploitative, you're going to discover that it doesn't matter how much drudgery you take away from your employees, they're going to be unhappy, uh, especially the ones leaving university at the moment. So, uh, how are we doing for time? Now, that is it. I'm being signaled. That's, that's it. Thank you so much you. to my panelists, Sasha, Phil, Justin. It was a real, real pleasure to spend some time with you. I hope that was informative for you. Uh, I think we're going down the back to, in order to meet the, meet the speakers. So follow the yellow paddle, the orange paddle. <laughs> <laughs>